Okay, great. Thanks, Sarah. Um, like you said, I'm Paul England, and I'm uh, director of our broadcast solutions here at NanoLumens, and we're going to go through some of the stuff that we do in the broadcast space, including our Studio Pro series. Um, first and foremost, let me cover a little bit about what makes NanoLumens special. First, we are a uh, maker of predominantly, almost exclusively, indoor displays um, and uh, mostly tighter pixel pitches. If you're familiar with what that means, we make four, five, six, and nine millimeter displays predominantly. We do have a few other sizes in there, but that's most of them. And what makes a nanolumens display special, um, they're very thin, they're lightweight, they're eco-friendly, they have fantastic image quality and a very user-friendly design. Something else that makes it special is we also design almost 100% of our displays are custom built uh, for a particular application. So it's not a matter of trying to uh, scram, uh, cram a square peg into a round hole. We, uh, we actually do make the displays specific for each application for each customer. So we put all these into five major categories. Nano wrap is our displays that are wrapped around a column. That can either be a cylindrical column or a square column. Uh, for example, you see that uh, Aaron Murray, the quarterback down there on the lower right, um, that's a square column that has a 90 degree edge in it. Um, in fact, when we do that, we can get a very, very tight corner. We only lose about one column of pixels when we, when we do that. So it becomes largely imperceptible from even a few feet away. But we also do cylindrical columns that are perfectly cylindrical and go around uh, columns of uh, almost really any size. And uh, we call those nano wrap. Nano slim is anything that's flat. So when we make a normal flat display, uh, we call it nano slim. If it's a curved display, not necessarily wrapping around the column, but if it's uh, just something that has a general arc to it, we call that a nano curve. Design specific, we do make some displays for some other industries um, that are components of other things, uh, you know, in casinos and some ATM components and some other things that are displays, but um, we call that design specific. And then finally, what you're probably most interested in being on this call is our Studio Pro series. And so let me dive a little bit closer into that. So this is an example of our Studio Pro series. This is one that was back in our labs. Doesn't have any uh, beautifying framing on the outside of it. Um, but you see uh, the image quality there. It's, uh, this is a very large display. This is about seven feet tall and about 14 feet wide. Very nice looking display. Um, you know, that's the real trick is uh, the resolution of these displays uh, it's really a function of what it looks like through the camera. Um, so it, and it looks fantastic on camera when, when it's being shot. Um, the biggest thing that does is it eliminates moray. And if you're familiar with that, um, here's a decent example of moray. Um, these are actually straight lines. The green and the red lines are straight lines. And you're seeing a wavy pattern in the middle. And moray is essentially a, uh, a byproduct. It's a, one of those physics things. But it's a byproduct of it's kind of an optical illusion where two patterns intersect. And those two patterns are incompatible with each other. And unfortunately, what that does is it gives us uh, uh, an interesting pattern. You may see this if you have uh, you know, an anchor that's wearing a, a houndstooth jacket or an unfortunate pattern uh, in a shirt, and you see sort of a, a funny rainbow-looking effect. Um, that's the moray effect. And LED displays um, do have a problem with this, uh, that you have the very bright pixels, and then around it you have um, the very dark rubber surrounds on the displays. Plus, you also have the uh, arrangement and alignment of the, the sub-pixels within the, within the display. And those all cause moray effect. So we actually solved this with the help of uh, Sony Broadcast Systems and some other partners in the, uh, in the industry. Um, we figured out ways to, to mitigate this. Um, the first one is if you look there on the left, that's how a conventional LED display, even some of our conventional displays, are manufactured with a triad of LEDs, a red, green, and blue LED basically in a little triangle. Sometimes these are discrete, meaning each one is a separate LED, and sometimes it's in a package. More often than not, in the smaller, uh, tighter pixel pitches, it's going to be in, in a LED package. But when you have those three, um, you introduce some additional error. So one of the things we did is we put them all in a line. So now they're vertical, kind of like a stoplight. What this does for us, uh, as you can see here, if I were having a color shift on that individual pixel from a very green dominant to a very blue dominant, I would have error moving left to right. If I was going from green dominant to red dominant, I'd have it going north and south on, on that. Um, and so what we did is by putting those in a line, we get rid of one axis of error in the individual pixel. So the only error is moving up and down and not moving in both directions. So it's harder for the camera to pick out patterns based on shifting in color. So that's the first part. Um, the second part is we actually introduce a lens over the top of it. And this lens, it's a multi-layer lens that does a variety of things. 
But one of the big things that it does is it uh, diffuses each individual pixel position. So that pixel position is a little bit soft in that individual position, but it still appears sharp to a camera. Um, it's a little trick that we play, um, but we, we have a very carefully designed lens that does this for us so it doesn't over soften the image. Uh, so the image is very sharp, but it doesn't have the Murray effect. Um, here's an example of what that looks like. So uh, that's an LED display. You'll, you'll see uh, it looks pretty bright in this picture because we, we exposed for the frame and not for the uh, display. But that's the, uh, that's the face lens on the front of it. Um, that is on a rack that actually slides back to lock in place. And then we have some focusing elements that uh, allow us to, uh, to get that locked in. Um, this is how a good number of our, our displays are designed um, around using very similar technology. To this. So um, this is a lens that we designed. It's not a simple diffuser. It actually does a few other things than that. Um, and it is a lens that we designed and developed in our labs and have manufactured uh, for us. And it, it is a patented technology. In addition to eliminating more, um, it also adds fantastic amounts of contrast um, uh, for an LED display. If you compare this to something like a rear projection system, rear projection system, sometimes you have to stack two and three projectors to get bright enough uh, to, to have a good image. Um, LEDs are capable of much, much more power than that. So we, we kind of go the other direction where we turn our displays way down uh, so you're not shooting at, you know, F22 or F45 or some crazy thing. Um, most of the time on set, you're going to be shooting at probably F2.8 or F2, maybe even F4. Um, so to do that, we can turn ours way, way down. The other thing is our screen actually acts as a neutral density filter. So by doing that, it gives us a little bit more dynamic range in terms of total headroom. Um, then the third thing that it does is it vastly improves the off-axis viewing angle. The image itself is projected on the very front surface of the display, so it gives us nearly 180 degrees in all directions uh, of viewing angle. So you get some really interesting shots with some uh, interesting pulls uh, or, uh, or drag a uh, steady cam across the face of it and, uh, and still be able to see it even when you're almost completely flush with the display. So very interesting on that. The other uh, thing that makes our displays kind of interesting here is that we have very, very good control over white balance. Um, you guys are probably certainly familiar with, uh, with the uh, chores that your lighting directors have to put up with uh, in terms of um, some combination of these days incandescent, fluorescent, LED, all sorts of different lighting technologies that give them a bunch of different colors. Well, the resulting color you white balance your cameras to, of course. So you use a white card and, and get your cameras uh, white balanced into the display. Um, well, that's a real problem with other displays that don't have very good temperature control um, because they don't appear to have natural colors. We actually can set ours to almost any temperature you can imagine on set. Uh, we have incredibly high control of it. And you don't even have to guess at what that number is. You might say, well, I think we're about 3,300. Um, we actually do it a much better way than that. We throw a SIMPTI chart. You're probably familiar with the standard SIMPTI chart there. Um, but we throw a SIMPTI chart up on the display. And using the calibrated camera, something that's already white balanced to the room and to the talent, um, we use the signal from that, and we run that into a vector scope. Um, using a SIMPTI chart, we use the vector scope to push out to our targets of red, green, and blue. And then we switch to a solid white display, and then we see the vector uh, plot diagram collapse down to its central point. So once we know that, we can actually make uh, minor tweak adjustments to that central point, and then we know we're, we're uh, dead money in white balance. Once you get it there, it has a, uh, a very interesting thing that doesn't happen with a lot of equipment we have to deal with, and that is it doesn't drip. Once you get it there, it's going to stay there uh, within, you know, maybe 1%. It's going to stay there for uh, a long, long, long time. So we have quite a few of these in the field. Uh, we have some customers that have been running these 24 hours a day in a news network, and they've done basically no adjustment to it in, in uh, more than six months. So um, not a whole lot of uh, adjustment or maintenance that has to go on with these displays from a brightness or, or a failure or a color temperature or any other adjustment. Basically, you wipe the face of it with a, uh, a uh, soft dry cloth or uh, occasionally um, water and a rag uh, if uh, your weatherman keeps touching the face of it uh, after he's um, been eating Cheetos or something. But uh, other than that, you're, uh, you really don't have a whole heck of a lot of maintenance on these things. So uh, let's talk about some of the advantages of the Studio Pro in broadcast. Compared to a rear projection system, and you see quite a few of these out in the, uh, out in the industry, lots of rear projection is out there. Um, a rear projection system does a very nice job. It's a very high resolution display. Some of the bigger, brighter projectors can make a very nice image for a studio backwall system. It works very well. 
However, um, it doesn't have very great native temperature control, and without getting too technical, that's somewhat due to the refresh rate in the uh, in the actual uh, imaging sensor, or not sensor, the imaging chip that's in there uh, in the projector. Um, but they just don't have a whole lot of control over where they can set their white balance. Some of the nicer projectors do have a decent amount of white balance control, but we have almost infinite control over refresh rate and uh, and uh, color temperature. Um, the second thing is our displays are much thinner. So compared to a rear projection system, that's usually 16, 18, 20 feet uh, of throw distance. Even on a reflex system, you're probably looking at six or seven feet. My displays are generally less than a foot. Uh, they can be on a Studio Pro as thin as six inches. Um, and even on uh, some of the uh, more complicated designs, we're almost never thicker than about three feet thick at our worst um, uh, in terms of thickness. The other thing is much less maintenance. Um, projectors, if, if you have a projector system, I'm not telling you anything new here, but um, you, especially in, in if you're running at 24 hours a day, you're replacing bulbs pretty frequently, which is a lot of labor, and those are pretty expensive bulbs too. And once you change the bulb, you have to recalibrate that to match the other systems in the in the uh, in the uh, back wall system. And you're also having to do alignment and do calibration, color calibration, and uh, edge blending, and all this other stuff. So there's a lot of labor involved, and a lot of maintenance involved. Um, they also put a bunch a heat out. Uh, your lighting director is always struggling with their heating budget. Um, they want to hang some more lights, but there's just only so much air conditioning you can pump in there. Um, a typical projector may put out hundreds or even thousands of BTUs. My display puts out about 40 BTUs an hour. That's about what one uh, breathing human being is putting out. So the respiration of one human being is about what my entire heat output is. So virtually uh, non-existent when it comes to a heat budget. Now compared to a direct view LCD or plasma, and, and this is also including doing these as a video wall, maybe you're tiling these together so you've got uh, um, a system uh, tied together, we have much better nat native temperature control over white balance, much better than, than even the, the high-end uh, LCD and plasma systems. We have virtually unlimited maximum size. We do have some minor limitations in terms of our screen manufacturer. Uh, their, their machine can only go so big, but that size is probably quite a bit bigger than you'd ever put in a television studio. So we really don't have a, a limit to that. Um, in the linear dimension, uh, it'd be a real big studio uh, bit before you'd ever get to sort of any limit there. Um, we're not locked into a 16 by 9 aspect ratio. We can make squares, we can make rectangles, we can also make ticker bars and desk facades and uh, we can make cylindrical displays that are still Studio Pro and look fantastic. So it doesn't have to be some uh, combination of a 16 by 9 aspect ratio, and it also doesn't have the, the bezels in between. Even the so-called bezel-free LCDs still have bezels, and there's not much you can do about that. Ours are truly bezel-free. There's nothing in between. And then the last thing is more consistent operation. Like I mentioned before, uh, we have quite a few of these out in the field, and the, uh, the technicians, when I talk to the engineers, they say, we simply don't touch it. You know, it, it's, uh, it stays up, it looks great, and we don't have to uh, mess around with it a whole lot. So let me show you some pictures. This first one is a uh, one that was in our, our showroom uh, here in, uh, in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, and this system, that was about uh, seven and a half feet tall, and it's about 14 or so feet wide. Um, real nice looking display, looks fantastic on camera, um, and uh, it's a, a big bright display. That one's a fairly gentle curve. We've done some slightly tighter curves. Let me show you a few other pictures. This is uh, in a uh, new studio over in Europe. Um, you'll see how pink it looks. That's actually because that studio was white balanced down to, if I remember correctly, about 3,200 Kelvin. So it does make what you're seeing on the screen with the naked eye or with this uh, handheld camera look pretty uh, look pretty pink. But on camera, that's uh, very beautiful and white. And we do have uh, very good control over our total white balance there. Um, this next one's at a, a new studio here domestically. This is in the United States. Um, it's a big, beautiful wall. This is one of the largest ones we've done. Uh, this one's a little over seven feet tall and about 15 feet wide. They use it all the time for a variety of things. They uh, they use it for uh, graphics packages as a back wall in the, the new studio. They've done weather on it. They've done political coverage on it. They take direct satellite feed and pump that in. Uh, they can actually uh, do a four box on it. I've seen they, they do a variety of different shots um, with this. They also run a, a jib or steady cam right up to it and, uh, and do drag shots across the face of it. Do some real creative things with this one, um, so that's a, that's a great one. Some other things that we do, we do a lot of uh, studio desk facades, so the face of the desk. These are some that we've uh, done for a network over in Asia, um, and as you see, they're all very interesting shapes. Uh, the upper left one is kind of a wave 
The one next to that is a gentle curve. The lower left is a very difficult one. That's kind of a W shape. You have two flat sides and then a curved space in the middle. That is a Studio Pro. Um, that was a very interesting uh, desk to, to try and have to design. But it goes to show that we are not afraid of the very difficult designs. Set designers come up with beautiful and creative things all the time. We love to jump right in and uh, make our stuff um, uh, fit the, their spaces. The lower right-hand corner is actually one of the, um, much like we saw um, that picture of a, a football player earlier, this is a 90 degree um, and it goes around that bend um, and uh, is, is also a very nice looking desk facade. This is not the only things we do in broadcast. So I, I shared with you Studio Pro. Um, we're not quite ready to, uh, to uh, open the kimono on our new technology, but we currently have some really interesting things in our lab in the broadcast space that we're really hoping to be able to share with you here in the next uh, probably four to six months. Um, we're not quite ready for prime time on that, uh, so we'll hopefully be able to share that sometime soon. But we are designing some brand new technology that is going to make um, these uh, displays sharper uh, pixel pitch, easier to maintain, and even less expensive to own and operate, including capital expenditure. Uh, so those are going to be very fantastic. Uh, stay tuned. We'll uh, certainly make an announcement uh, once we have those available. But uh, some really great stuff going on in our labs, and we uh, we don't rest on our laurels. We don't uh, only try and sell you what we invented a year ago. We are always working on inventing new things. One other thing I'd definitely like to point out is nanolumens. Uh, we have what I believe is the finest warranty in this business. So um, other manufacturers may give you 30, 60, or 90 days, maybe a year, maybe two or three years, um, but nobody has a six-year warranty. Um, and most everybody else's warranty is usually a 1% failure rate or half a percent failure rate, which sounds like a pretty small number. But some of the studio backwall systems we were showing you have more than a million pixels. So on a display with a million pixels, if a half a percent has to fail, that's 5,000 pixels have to fail before they're going to warranty that display. Uh, we will warranty down to an individual pixel, one pixel, all the way down to a single pixel for six years. So the rest of the industry may think we're nuts, but uh, maybe we're crazy like a fox. We just... Um, truly believe that we have a fantastic product. We stand behind it. We design and develop all these boards here in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, I also mentioned that we have our entire engineering staff here. We've got electrical engineers, mechanical engineers, industrial engineers, civil engineers. We have a full engineering staff. We're very engineering heavy, which means that when we dive into your project, we're not making guesses. We're using uh, real science and real engineering to, to make fantastic products. So unlike the other people who go to Asia and buy the lowest uh, bidder and, and sell it cheap, we're designing and developing all of that here. This is a made in the USA product. Um, we do assemble all the displays here. We design all the components here. Um, so we do make these displays in Atlanta, Georgia, and uh, we do all the engineering for fitting them into even the, the craziest of spaces. So um, a quick note about who Nanolumens is. We are a manufacturer, one of the world's uh, leading manufacturers of LED displays. Uh, I, I think we are the absolute leader in indoor display technology. We make very lightweight, slim uh, displays of any size, shape, or curvature. Um, we're used in uh, transit systems and retail spaces and uh, casinos and all sorts of different places. Um, what, one of the things you're seeing in this picture here, the USA letters, those are about six feet tall, and that's a good example of an architectural application. In fact, we've been talking to a television studio about doing call letters. Um, that will be cut out and uh, be a display. That is a display. That flag normally waves. Uh, you're not seeing the video here. You're just seeing a still picture, but that is a display. Um, and so that's one of those things. We've done corporate logos. We've done other shapes. Um, and so we can do very interesting displays like that as well. And uh, if you'd like to contact Nanolumens, here's our contact information. <clears throat> you can also contact me directly at P England. P is involved. England, just like the country at nanolumens.com, and here's our phone numbers. Um, you can certainly reach us at any time. I also welcome you, if you're going to be in the Atlanta, Georgia area, you'd like to come by our showroom. We've got about a 6,000 square foot showroom, usually with about a dozen to 15 displays in it, depending on uh, what's coming and what's going. But um, So we have a nice big display area that we'd love to show you if you're ever in the area. Also, um, that same email address I gave you, pengland at nanolumens.com, I will personally be out at NAB along with um, a few of my uh, engineers, colleagues, and development associates. And uh, if you would love to, uh, if you'd like to meet with us, we'd love to do that. Uh, happy to buy you a cup of coffee and um, show you a whole bunch of displays uh, from uh, installations around the world. We do quite a bit of that. 
And uh, again, if you have any questions on this stuff, feel free to, to drop either me a line or you can simply send it to sales at nanolemons or info at nanolemons.com or give us a call and we're, uh, we're happy to find those answers for you. But uh, other than that, we thank you for your time today and I'll give it back to Sarah.